Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, we're going to get started. So apologies again about the food mix-up. I'm not sure what happened with that order, but they're trying to get food here by the end of the event. So when you leave, hopefully Emory Catering will have some food for you guys. Apologies again. But good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Poza, and I'm a 2L at Duke Law. I, along with my fellow coordinators, Frank Leisman and Farah Barra, would like to welcome you to the 2018 final round of the Jessup Cup Moot Court Competition. Before we get started, please make sure that your phones are either off or silenced. Uh, it can be really distracting for the competitors for phones to be going off in the middle of their arguments. Also, please keep your seats once the tournament has started. Uh, the doors can be pretty loud, so same thing. The Jessup Cup is Duke Law's intramural tournament based on the Philip C. Jessup International Law Moot Court Competition. Each fall, Duke Law students compete for moot court moot court board membership by arguing a closed universe international law problem before the International Court of Justice. For many participants, Jessup Cup is the first time that they have participated in a moot court style competition and the first time that they have been exposed to international law. We are honored to welcome as our judges today, Professors Bradley, Huckerbee, and Michaels. Arguing today are Eric Reutemann for the applicant, Anduchenka, and Brent McKnight for the respondent, Ruka Ruku. Eric Reutemann is a 1L at Duke Law. He earned his BA in International Business from The Ohio State University. Prior to attending law school, Eric competed for the Ohio State University mock trial team. Brent McKnight is also a 1L at Duke Law. He was a Moorhead Kane Scholar at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he earned a BA in History and Global Studies with a PPE minor. Prior to attending law school, Brent was a fundraising professional for Pisco Legal Services. This year's problem concerns two issues, the capture of a marine vessel and the breach of nuclear disarmament obligations. The two countries party to this dispute are the People's Democratic Republic of Anduchenka, the applicant, and the Federal Republic of Rukuruku as the respondent. Anduchenka and Rukuruku are two states in the Odessara region, both with a coast on the Kumatkesh Ocean. In 1947, Anduchenka and Rukuruku signed a Treaty of Friendship, Commerce, and Navigation. In 1967, Anduchenka's military staged a successful coup d'etat, and General Rafik Tovarish was installed as the country's head of state and head of government. Under the leadership of General Tovarish, Anduchenka adopted a socialist political ideology, which led to strained relations with the other Odesaran states. In October 2015, the Anduchenkin Navy captured a Rukurukin autonomous underwater vehicle called the EGART, which was operating without permission less than 11 nautical miles from the Anduchenkin coast. Anduchenka refused to return the EGART to Rukuruku. In April 2017, the Anduchenkin Navy revealed that it had a nuclear armed submarine called the Ibra. Anduchenka filed an application instituting proceedings against Rukuruku invoking the Treaty of Friendship, Commerce, and Navigation as the basis for the court's jurisdiction. Rukuruku then filed counterclaims. The issues in this dispute are, one, whether Rukuruku violated Article 6 of the Treaty of Friendship, Commerce, and Navigation when the EGAR operated in Anduchenka's territorial sea, and two, whether Anduchenka violated Article 16 of that same treaty by commissioning and operating the EBRA. We hope you enjoy the competition and good luck to our competitors. All rise. The International Court of Justice is now in session. The Honorable President Bradley and the Honorable Judges Huckerby and Michaels presiding. The case before the court is the case concerning the EGART and the IBRA. The parties are applicant, the People's Democratic Republic of Anduchenka versus respondent, Federal Republic of Rukuruku. The applicant and the respondent are each allocated 12 minutes to present their pleadings.
We are here to consider the case concerning the EGART and the EBRA, People's Democratic Republic of Anduchenka versus Federal Republic of Rukuruku. And we will hear first from the applicant for Anduchenka. May I reserve two minutes for rebuttal? Before I begin, would your honors prefer that I give a brief restatement of the facts? I do not think that is necessary. Thank you. All right. May it please the court. My name is Eric Reutemann, agent for the applicant, the People's Democratic Republic of Anduchenka. This is a case about protecting the sovereignty of an independent nation. Accordingly, the applicant respectfully requests that this court find in its favor for the following two main reasons. First, because the respondent's decision to send a spy drone into the sovereign waters of Anduchenka was not an innocent passage, but rather a gross violation of sovereignty. And second, because the applicant nation is not and has never been under any obligations under international law that would prevent its use of a nuclear submarine for deterrence. Agent, I already have a question. You referred to something as a spy drone. Is there something in the compromise in the facts that indicate uh, what the purpose of that uh, vehicle was? Yes, uh, Your Excellency. The purpose of the vehicle was to collect visual and acoustic data. Uh, there is a dispute as to what that data was being used for. Uh, the respondent claims that it's being used for the purposes of tracking pirates. The applicant believes it is possible that it is being used for the purpose of, uh, of collecting data that could be used in a military attack against Anduchenka, considering the relations between these two nations. Do you have any evidence in the record indicating that the purpose was to uh, spy or can, can have some espionage purpose? Yes, Your Excellency. Uh, these these uh, un unmanned vehicles that the respondent nation is using typically stay outside of the territorial sea of uh, the applicant nation. However, this one was not outside the territorial sea. It was within the territorial sea, and it was collecting the kind of visual and acoustic data that could be used in a military strike. And I'd actually like to take that to my first point about innocent passage. It is true under the international custom of innocent passage that in certain circumstances, the vessels of foreign nations can travel through the territorial sea of other nations. However, the respondents' actions in this case do not constitute an innocent passage. Now, the United Nations Convention of Law on the Sea outlines certain governmental naval activities which are categorically considered not to be innocent passages. Uh, rather, they, they are prejudicial to the peace, good order, and security of the coastal state. Can I just interrupt? Are you relying on customary international law at the moment, or are you relying on the United Nations, uh, on UNCLOS? Both, Your Excellency. Okay. So the, the Innocent Passage Doctrine, as outlined in the United Nations Convention of Law on the Sea, has become accepted as international custom. Okay. So under that, uh, under the United Nations Convention of Law on the Sea, any act aimed at collecting information to the prejudice of the defense or security of the coastal state is not an innocent passage, as well as the carrying out of research or survey activities. Uh, additionally, during an innocent passage, underwater vehicles are required to travel at the surface of the water with the country's flag raised. Now, the respondent nation's actions in this case fly in the face of all of those rules. This underwater vehicle was traveling submerged below the surface. And there was no flag on it. Uh, additionally, it was collecting, as Respondent Nation admits, it was collecting visual and acoustic data like we were talking about. Agent, um, if we accept that um, the underwater vehicle was a vessel for the purpose of UNCLOS and customary international law, um, isn't there a force majeure argument to be made here um, that the vehicle was programmed not to go within 12 nautical miles, uh, for example? How do we interpret a potential, uh, the intention um, of the respondent? Well, it, Your Excellency, the absence of malicious intent uh, should not uh, be dispositive in this case. It's not that intent doesn't matter, but the lack of malicious intent shouldn't cancel out the argument here. What's because the international law argument for intent being irrelevant here? Well, so the international law argument goes back to the prohibition of, of, of passages that are prejudicial to peace, good order, and security. Uh, if a vessel travels even accidentally, into the waters of another nation and then collects data that could be later used in a military strike, especially if those nations are having poor relations, then that data is prejudicial to the peace, good order, and security of the state. That, that passage uh, is not allowed under innocent passage doctrine. And that's what we have here. Uh, clearly, the, the respondent's actions don't constitute an innocent passage. Rather, they're a blatant violation of Anduchenkin sovereignty. 
And that means that the respondent nation violated Article 6 of the FCN Treaty between these two nations. Uh, Agent, I have a question. Assuming for the sake of argument that that's correct, that there was a violation, uh, I have a question about the proper remedy. Uh, if the intrusion into the territorial waters was inadvertent and there was no malintent, uh, why does that give your country a, uh, the remedy of seizing and keeping uh, the other country's property? Well, the applicant nation believes that by seizing the property, it disincentivizes future uh, encroachments into the territorial sea because there is a possibility that this was not accidental. Uh, however, so your argument is that, let's suppose a, a very large vessel accidentally uh, b goes off course slightly, you can just seize that uh, billion dollar vessel and keep it as a deterrent? Well, it, it certainly depends on, on other circumstances. If, in this case, it is unclear whether or not the intent was, was there or not. Uh, if you were to know for certain that this billion dollar vessel were to veer off course and you knew for certain it was an accident, that might change the calculus. Uh, however, in this case, we don't quite know the intent. And so the intent of Anduchenko was to disincentivize future encroachments. And that brings me to the second part of my argument. The respondent nation alleges that the applicant nation violated Article 16 of the FCN Treaty with regards to international law obligations to disarm nuclear weapons. However, this allegation is based on a false premise because Anduchenka isn't actually under any international law obligations that prevent its use of IBRA, the nuclear submarine in this case. First of all, Anduchenka has never signed or ratified any international nuclear arms deal. It's never signed the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It's never signed the NPT. In fact, it's been a persistent objector to the NPT. When the document was first signed, they, they explicitly refused to sign it and, and gave reasons for why they did not want to be yeah, part. And on that, Agent, can you clarify what the reasons were given and how that can amount to a claim under international law that the applicant has been a persistent objector to the norm? Yes, Your Excellency. I, I believe the, the claim was that they believe the terms were too restrictive on their sovereignty, uh, and, and they, they, didn't, they didn't feel that comfortable with, with con complying with all the terms of the agreement. Um, and that goes to uh, object, persistent object, objector doctrine, because uh, when, when, a, when there's an international agreement and a nation persistently objects to it from the beginning, uh, not later, but from the beginning and onwards through time, uh, the, the, uh, the doctrine states that they shouldn't necessarily be bound by the confines of that document. The, tempor the temporal piece you have right, right, that you need to make the objection at the time at the formation of the rule. Um, help me a bit more on how the reasons for the objection, like merely being inconvenienced by a rule, for example, would not suffice to, yes. to blocking the doctrine. Yes, Your Excellency, I agree. However, that those weren't the reasons uh, for Andrzejewski's objection in this case. They were specifically concerned with an infringement on their sovereignty as a nation, uh, not not with merely being inconvenienced, but with their national rights uh, to to defend themselves how they see fit. Uh, and, and that goes to the issue here. As a persistent objector, they should not be subject to the terms of the NPT. Now, this court has found in the case of Marshall Islands versus the United Kingdom that it is possible that one article of the NPT, one article alone, Article 6, could be considered international custom. And if that was true, then Article 6 might be binding on the Anduchenkin, or on the Anduchenkin government. Now, article 6 deals with the, an obligation to pursue negotiations in good faith to the cessation of the nuclear arms race. And actually, that Marshall Islands case uh, provides us with some guidance as to what constitutes a violation of Article 6. In that case, the United Kingdom was the respondent, and they were an original signer of the NPT. They, they said that they prescribed to its terms consistently. And in that case, the United Kingdom was alleged to have breached Article 6 after refusing good faith negotiations on, the, on nuclear disarmament for nearly 40 years. Um, in thinking about whether there's a violation here of customary international law, what weight should we give to the Security Council's finding uh, that that that's activity, in fact, is a threat to the peace? Your Honor, I believe the Security Council should not, or the Security Council resolution should not be binding on Anduchenka for the very reason we've been talking about. The very first line of the Security Council resolution 3790 is that its purpose is to reaffirm its commitment to the terms of the NPT. Uh, again, because Anduchenka is a persistent objector uh, to the NPT, it would be grossly unfair and a violation of the persistent objector status to subject the nation to the terms of, of a treaty that it never agreed to. But the Security Council has legislative authority to override customary international law. Actually, Your Honor, according to the Kosovo advisory opinion, uh, Security Council resolutions may be binding on other states, 
However, they are not necessarily binding, and other factors should figure into that calculus, including relevant political factors. The relevant political factor here being the NPT and Anduchenka's persistent objection to being confined by its terms. And that leads us to the greater issue in this case. Even as Anduchenka has acted solely within its sovereign rights, the respondent nation has violated that, those same rights. And for the foregoing reasons, I respectfully ask that the court find in the favor of the applicant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, agent for the respondent, Rukuruku. May it please the court. My name is Brent McKnight, and I'm here today as an agent for the respondent. The case at bar revolves around protecting the freedom of navigation on the world's oceans, a principle dating back centuries to the work of Hugo Grotius in Mari Librum. First, I will argue that the, the respondent did not violate Article 6 of the FCN Treaty by operating the eager in the applicant's territorial seas. And second, I'll argue that the applicant did violate Article 16 of the FCN Treaty by commissioning and operating a dangerous nuclear submarine. As a Excuse me, Agent, are you restricting your argument to the treaty, or are you going beyond that in terms of the sources that you're going to invoke? Uh, Your Excellency, I plan to invoke several sources uh, through the course of the argument. But as a threshold matter, Your Excellency, I would like to invoke Article 20 of the FCN Treaty, which only gives this court jurisdiction over disputes arising from Articles 11 through 19 of the treaty. And thus, this court should uh, dismiss the Article 6 claim for lack of jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. However, even if this court did want to adjudicate the claim, the outcome would be uh, no different. I agree with the applicant that the eager ought to be governed by the innocent passage regime. However, no violation of the regime happened. The data collected by the eager was simply incidental to its safe transit. The eager is equipped with a sophisticated sense and avoid system that requires optical and acoustic data in order to sense obstacles and navigate safely around them. So, ancient is your argument that if uh... If this vessel sailed purposely uh, within 12 miles of the coast, it would still be lawful? Uh, Your Excellency, I do think it would be lawful, particularly since Article 7 of the FCN Treaty provides for total freedom of uh, commerce and navigation between the two contracting parties. Is this commerce, uh, or is this, how do we know whether this is uh, covered by the Innocent Passage Allowance under international law? Uh, I think that the Innocent Passage governs. Um, is considered customary international law, and Article 17 shows that it governs ships in particular. Although UNCLOS does not give any explicit definition of the word ship, the Conventions on the Prevention of Pollution of the Sea by Oil and the Convention on the Prevention of the Pollution of the Sea by Ships both define ships very broadly as uh, any vessel of any type operating in a marine environment. The court ought to adopt this broad definition of the word ship for the purpose of accounting for the rapidly changing technologies in maritime. Well, if you're accepting the UNCLOS as our guidance here, it also says in Article 19 that research activities do not qualify. Yes, Your Excellency. And as I've noted, uh, this was not research per se, but was merely data collection incidental to the types of computations needed to sense obstacles and navigate around. What was the purpose of the vehicle, if it's not research? Uh, it's unclear from the facts, Your Excellency, what the, what the purpose was. But the purpose of Article 19 is to prevent passage that would be prejudicial to the good order, peace, and security of the state. And the respondent has a long history of sharing all the data that it collects with every state in the Odisara region, including that of the applicant. And there's no reason to think that they would not have also shared that data in this case as well had the applicant not stolen the eager. So is your argument, Agent, that uh, there is no justification to rely on sovereignty because uh, your party in goodwill shares all the outcomes of its research? I think so, Your Excellency. And I think that also the Article 7 of the FC entry that I mentioned earlier, uh, the applicant actually invited freedom of navigation in its seas mm -hmm. and thus cannot appeal to incidental data collection in order to justify a violation. And the applicant also relied on Article 20 uh, as a possible violation of UNCLOS. However, the applicant's own Naval Chief of Staff bragged about how easy it was to send GPS coordinates to the eager for the purpose of bringing it to shore. 
However, as the facts show, the egret must be traveling on the surface of the water in order to receive those GPS coordinates. In addition, the applicant tries to construe the phrase, show their flag in Article 20, as meaning there must be a flag hoisted up into the air. There's no way to get that narrow requirement from a plain text reading of the article pursuant to Article 31 of the Vienna Convention. As such, the, admiral's, uh, the Naval Chief of Staff of the applicant noted how easy it was to identify that the egret belonged to the respondent, indicating that there were easily identifiable marks such as a flag on the outside of the egret. For these reasons, the egret was violating no, uh, none of the rules on innocent passage and yet the applicant still saw fit to steal the egret from the respondent and refuse to give it back. And there is, seems to be no precedent for this action under the innocent passage regime. Sorry, I'm, Asia. I'm still a, a bit um, concerned about your response to my learned colleague about the fact that even if you had been deliberately within the 12 miles that you would be in compliance with the treaty um, and international law. Can you explain a little bit more the rationale for that under international law and under the... Um, Yes, Your Excellency. Yes, Your Excellency. Uh, parties who uh, enter into treaties are bound by those treaties. And in Article 7 of, this, of the FCN Treaty, it says that both parties have total freedom of navigation within uh, each other's territorial seas. And so the... the as, requ as required under international law. Is that in Article 7? Article 6. Mm -hmm. Oh, Article 6. So I'm referring to a different article, Your Excellency, but under Article uh, 6, the... Um, I guess I'm arguing that, that because the research was, was not research for a particular purpose, was, but just was incidental to its passage, and in addition, because there was no violation of Article 20, uh, the eager was actually just innocently passing through, and thus would be uh, not violating um, the innocent passage regime. At this point, Your Excellencies, I'd like to go ahead and turn to Article 16, uh, of which the applicant is in blatant violation. The applicant has claimed persistent objector status by virtue of having objected to the non-proliferation treaty since 1968. However, a state can only claim persistent objector status if it started objecting, or cannot, yeah, cannot uh, claim persistent objector status if it started objecting after the law was solidified into international Agent, law. Before we get to that issue, we still we first would have to be convinced that customary international law prohibits the acquisition of nuclear weapons by non-MPT states. And what, what's the evidence that that's true under customary national law, given that there are a number of states that currently have developed nuclear weapons and that have not felt, uh, not believe themselves to be under a violation of international norms? Yes, Your Excellency. The, uh, I'd like to start in 1946, and when, uh, when the UN General Assembly, of which the applicant is a member, unanimously voted for a resolution working towards the prohibition of atomic weapons. And again, in 1954, the UN General Assembly, of which the applicant was a member, voted unanimously to work towards the prohibition of the use and manufacture of nuclear weapons. The 1968 Non-Proliferation Treaty is simply a reiteration of international obligations that were already accepted by state practice and continued to be as shown by the fact that 182 states signed and ratified the Non-Proliferation Treaty. The question for this court would be whether that customary international law is still here today, and the answer is yes. This court's own 1996 advisory opinion on the legality of the use of nuclear weapons unanimously held that there is an obligation for all states to pursue nuclear disarmament in good faith. Agent, may I just uh, interrupt? Is the exact obligation to work towards the abol abolition of nuclear weapons, or is it the actual obligation to not have nuclear weapons? Uh, Your Excellency, this court's uh, 1996 <laughs> opinion noted that the although the language of the obligation is to pursue negotiations, this is uh, to achieve a very precise result, which is actually having no nuclear weapons. In addition, Your Excellency, uh, uh, Article 16 focuses on the import and export or prohibits the import and export of weapons and, and uh, ammunition. And in this case, uh, the, ever since the coup d'etat that uh, installed a dictatorial and militant regime, they have been accepting uh, military and economic development aid from socialist countries that may have actually provided the very nuclear weapons in question here. And so I allege that 
they uh, or hold that they violated Article 16 on two counts, not just one. At this point, I'd like to turn to the UN Security Council resolution. Under Article 39 of the UN Charter, the Security Council is given full power to, dis, uh, to discern, to seek out any sort of threats to international peace that may exist. And when they issue resolutions, Article 25 of the UN Charter binds all, US, or all UN members to follow the measures that have been proposed. The applicant premises his entire argument on trying to protect the right to national sovereignty. This is the very same right that the applicant would take away from all the other states in the Odisar region by virtue of operating a nuclear submarine capable of striking any state in the Odisar region from anywhere in the Kamakish. Agent, the Security Council resolution could have but does not use mandatory language in specifying uh, how the nation should act. It uses phrases like calls upon. That seems to be a deliberate choice because in other resolutions it's used more mandatory language when it has wanted to impose a legally binding obligation. How do you explain that? Uh, Your Excellency, uh, I think it's uh, explained in part because this is an unfolding situation that has not yet been totally resolved and is not yet clear, and that's why we're in this court today, Your Excellencies. But I think that the measures that the Security Council calls on other nations to take to neutralize the threat posed by the EBRA uh, poses uh, the possibility that the conflict here could escalate further if this court were not to issue a binding decision now that would uh, prevent any sort of uh, increased instability uh, in the region. Um, is the court, much of your argument depends on the court being bound by the Security Council resolution finding, the factual finding that we have a current threat to international peace and security. Are we bound to follow? That finding? You're, you're actually, Your Excellency, I don't think that you're bound to follow it. And I think that uh, the Security Council argument is actually just uh, secondary to my primary argument that the applicant has no basis for uh, persistent objector status and claiming that in relation to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. For the foregoing reasons, Your Excellencies, I ask that you find in favor of the respondent that the respondent did not violate Article 6 of the FCN Treaty and that the applicant did violate Article 16 of the FCN Treaty by uh, commissioning and operating the EBRA. I ask the court today to make a ruling that would protect freedom of navigation on the world's seas. Thank you. Agent for the applicant. On the day that the NPT was signed, the government of the applicant nation stated that they were objecting to the treaty because it established and aggravated an inherent inequality between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. When the treaty was supposed to be reaffirmed 25 years later, the applicant nation objected again. Agent, I mean, objecting to inherent inequality, is that the language we're meant to be relying upon to find an assertion of sovereignty claims here? Yes, Your Excellency. As a non-nuclear weapon state, by agreeing to be bound by these terms, the applicant nation's sovereignty is being violated because uh, they're required to agree to inherently unequal terms at international law. And they've objected to this uh, when the treaty was signed, 25 years later when it was reaffirmed, and as this case has become an issue over the last several years. They are a persistent objector to the NPT, and it would be unlawful to bind them to its terms. Additionally, agent for the respondent mentioned the UN Charter, but he didn't mention a very important part of Article 2. Article 2 specifically prohibits any member of the United Nations from infringing on the territorial integrity of other nations. Now, when the respondent nation sent a drone into applicant nation waters and, and collected the kind of data that they could use for military strike, they infringed on the territorial sovereignty as prohibited in the UN Charter. That really brings us to the, the key issue in this case. Ultimately, the respondent nation overstepped their bounds. They overstepped their bounds as a member of the UN. They overstepped their bounds as a member of the UN Security Council. They overstepped their bounds as a neighbor to Anduchenko. And in doing so, they grossly violated Anduchenko's sovereignty. 
For the foregoing reasons, I respectfully ask the court find in favor of the applicant. Thank you. All rise. You both did an amazing job. Um, well, the judges are going to deliberate for a few minutes, and then they'll be back to announce the winner and give feedback to the competitors. So uh, just hang out and enjoy yourselves for a minute. You can talk about the problem. Uh, it's really interesting, but uh, the judges will announce momentarily.
Please be seated. Thanks. We, we thought we'd just give you a few uh, comments and observations. We thought the argument was very strong on both sides of the case. You didn't have a lot of time to work with either one, and uh, we really admired um, both of you um, not being so wedded to what you had planned on saying that, that you didn't answer us. In fact, you both, I thought, uh, took the time that it looked like we wanted from you when we asked questions, and you didn't seem to be bothered by the fact that it might take away from the time that you had planned for certain arguments. And you both pivoted, I thought, quite well uh, when we pushed on a line of argument. Even if we were pushing on something that you had already covered, you went back to it, and then that means maybe you had to skip something in your argument. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, it's always important to remember the, the, the job of the oral person making an argument is simply to help the judges. And um, it may be that if we spent the entire time on one issue, that's the help we might have needed, and that's, that's your job. And even if you don't cover everything you'd like to cover, we would have had your written materials anyway to, to cover all of that. Um, we thought both of you, it's obvious you must have been doing this uh, over this, uh, these other rounds, because both of you had great eye contact. Um, very good demeanor, very professional, I thought, in the way you uh, spoke and answered questions. And also, hugely important for any argument, but certainly for the Jessup uh, co type competition, is your command of the facts was very strong. Um, you know, in, you, I think both of you are first years, is that true? Uh, you'll learn more about international law as time goes on, I think. Um, although it wasn't obvious that you didn't didn't know a tremendous amount, but one of the things you'll learn, <laughs> one of the things you learn about international law is there's sometimes a frustration that there's not is not quite as clearly developed in some areas as you are used to in domestic law, and that means the facts really become important because equity is an important part of how do we decide anything when the law is kind of unclear on these issues. And both of you were getting into customary international law which is important as it is, can be particularly unclear and amorphous and subject to argument. And both of you, I think, realize that. Mm -hmm. And as we as judges, if we're on the International Court of Justice, would realize when we're announcing customary national law that we're also trying to frame principles that will be equitable and that will guide countries in a fair way going forward. It's not as if we think it's all dictated by some book that we can look at. In fact, that's very rarely the truth of customary international law. I think both of you were very good about that. Ultimately, and as, as hard a decision as it was, we thought um, ultimately that the applicant uh, was a bit stronger on the uh, overall. And so we give the uh, decision to the applicant, although I think both the respondent and applicant were very terrific uh, advocates. Um, a couple of things we observed, and I thought I'd also allow my co-judges uh, to say a couple of words as well, to give you a sense of what left imprinted in our minds from the argument. I really liked, uh, rebuttal's tricky. Uh, there's a, probably just as many times somebody hurts their case in rebuttal as they help it. Um, sometimes the most best rebuttal is basically to make it short and sit down before the judges start having new doubts. Um, but one thing you can do in rebuttal, and I thought you did very well, is to focus on something that maybe you could have done a little bit better on in the main argument, and then make sure the judges haven't forgot something. It's in the record, but it wasn't as much in your, which is uh, why, um, for example, uh, the country didn't join the MPT, and I thought uh, the inequality, my co-judge asked about that, but it was in the record. It wasn't clearly made in your main argument, and I thought you pulled that back into our consideration, because that's not just like the UNCLOS. The reason they didn't join UNCLOS is, we know they accept most of it, but there were some minor issues. They fundamentally think there's a problem with letting some states keep their weapons and other states not. It's a fundamental, and you said a sovereignty problem, and I think it could be. So that's a nice, you didn't try to cover everything, and I thought that, that struck me as a good way to begin uh, the rebuttal uh, point. Um, the other, I think one observation, uh, slightly more you know, kind of critically constructive for both of you, always watch out 
for overclaiming. I thought on both sides, you know, it's a, there's a tendency you get so invested in the argument that you want to like argue everything you can. And I think there was a, there's a little bit of a danger on that. So just to give you one example, um, I guess, uh, a Brent, I think. Uh, so I thought uh, you didn't need to argue as hard about um, it being potentially legal to uh, send the vehicle even with full intent, even maybe five feet from the coast. There's so much in the record to help you before you get to that point, like it was programmed for 12 miles. There's nothing in the record indicating you've had a, a pattern, for example, of trying to surveil the coast within 12 miles. I think the best uh, kind of, uh, sort of implications of the facts is this probably was a one-off that was kind of accidental. And I think we would be reluctant to endorse a principle that suggests nations can send the kind of underwater vehicles for whatever purpose really close to the coast with intent. I think since you had so many good arguments, I think that was one of the words you could argue it, but I probably would have waited on that one and, to, and let us push you before you had to try to defend uh, that. Um, although I think there was both sides needed to think about how far you wanted to push your arguments, but that was something that, that I was reminded of. So that was a couple of thoughts. Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to say first, that was really impressive from both, especially for first years, the, not just the command, also the ability to stay calm in face of questioning, etc and to stay to uh, your arguments, that was really very impressive. I, I, was, I was really impressed by both. Um, I would like to mention just briefly, if you want the counter side to what uh, Judge Bradley said, which concerns the fact that um, international law is somewhat uh, muddy, and so you have to do a lot with the facts. That is probably correct at the same time, and I'm sure he would not disagree, as concerns the facts, Make sure to stick to the facts as you have them and not to imply too much for two reasons. First, these are agreed upon facts, right? So this is the pattern that you have and that you can rely on. And second, if you start implying, not only do you raise open questions there, you also may run actually into more problems for your arguments. In, in this kind of case, it is uh, not only not necessary, but often uh, can even run counter to your uh, argument. And second, as concerns the law, especially where the law and the relations between different elements, the, the NPT, uh, the question of customary uh, international law, the FCN treaty, where that becomes unclear, you want to be extra clear in how they relate to each other. Where I interrupted you in the beginning on the relation there, um, between the FCN treaty and the other sources, it is helpful to keep those apart in the argument for analytical purposes precisely because their relation becomes problematic. It, um, the more you throw things together, the harder it becomes to uh, see your argument exactly in the law as opposed to more general invocation of general principles of fairness uh, or sovereignty um, in the large. Okay. Um, I'll echo my colleagues' comments and say um, thank you for um, a wonderful argument. Um, just a, a couple of very generic points on particularly engaging in oral advocacy around international law uh, questions. Uh, the first of which was the use of like, a, a general frame for your entire argument, followed up by the detailed argumentation under that. I think it's a very effective strategy and I would fully support pursuing that. I think be careful about what frame you pick. Um, so I think a sovereignty frame was a clear, obvious one in, in the context and made sense to me when I was trying to understand arguments. Um, a freedom of navigation frame, I, I kind of got hooked on the freedom piece, in which case that was more in the app. You know, it didn't work for both your arguments. Anyway, so just I think it's a good strategy, but didn't really be careful about what frame you pick in that regard. Um, to echo the comments about um, overclaiming that definitely happened, uh, you know, across the board, one way to be a bit more careful about that is to deploy much more sort of even if type arguments, right? So seed certain things and then keep going, right? Or so even if that is correct, what about this? And I feel that would maybe would have helped us understand a bit more um, some of the legal claims that you were making without pushing you into a corner where you felt you were defending a pretty untenable position for both at times. Um, I would echo the comments just made about knowing the factual claims, like inside out, not overstating a factual claim, not hesitating to take a moment and actually take judges to the compromise of the material, right, to the actual language, which ended up happening in rebuttal, but could have happened definitely in an earlier iteration. Um, and so really knowing your factual claims inside out. Two final um, 
overarching points. It really helped me um, as a judge a lot when I think you did it particularly um, when you're weighting your claims, right? I don't rely on this argument. This is my second argument. So again, more of that kind of technique where if you fall on something, then that was really helpful um, because if you, the Security Council argument wasn't the strongest argument for you here, right? So leaving that and then relying upon your argumentation around the MPT was very helpful. So more um, clear signaling and weighting of the order in which your claims need to be um, understood to be to be able to award you. Um, the argument is very, very helpful. Um, and then finally, it's just a very general comment for oral advocacy between, and talking primarily here in the Jessup context. I did Jessup when I was like, at law school as well. And so I love and also equally traumatized by these kind of um, <laughs> um, moments that we're having right now. Um, and, you know, we're always encouraged um, particularly to see questions as a chance to further explain, like not to, not to engage with them as a potentially hostile moment or to but to kind of and taking a moment like to stop and either answer yes or no and then to go into the explanation can be really helpful. And I think you both do that very effectively and I would encourage more of that, right? It's taking a moment to take it on board as a chance to further elucidate how you understand, quite frankly, some pretty tricky areas of international law and international sources and how they relate to the factual information. But thank you both. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out. Congratulations again to our Jessup Cup winner for 2018, Eric Reutemann, and to both of the amazing competitors. Mm -hmm. Great job. Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone sorry, <laughs> who made this competition possible, from the members of the Moot Court Board who helped with judging the previous rounds, to all of the competitors who participated in Jessup from the preliminary rounds through to the finals, and to the administrators who helped us plan the competition, and finally, of course, to our wonderful faculty judges. Uh, congratulations again. Uh, both of you did a fantastic job, and thank you all for attending the 2018 Jessup Cup Finals. We will have lunch in 10 minutes also, apparently. Really good job. <laughs> Very good job. Congratulations. Great job. Thank you so much. Oh, our pleasure. Yeah. Very helpful.